Hey everyone, we'll get started in just a minute. Um, just before we get into the webinar, I just wanted to um, see if you could hear me and see my screen. Um, so if you are able to see um, the screen, let me know. I'm gonna flip through a few slides. Um, and if you can hear me, just go into your questions box on your GoToWebinar panel and just put yes. Um, so that way I can make sure that everybody can hear me as I talk. Awesome, thank you guys so much. All right, so we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to our webinar on web design for nonprofits. I'm really excited about this webinar. It's kind of a cool topic. It's always a fun one to talk about. Uh, my name is Linda Gerhardt, and I'm the Senior Community Engagement Manager here at Mighty Cause. I've been with Mighty Cause since 2016, and I actually head up our digital marketing efforts and create most of our content. Um, I come from a background in communications, and I've worked for nonprofits of all sizes, a couple of really big ones, a couple of really small ones, and I've actually been in charge of creating and updating nonprofit websites for nonprofits of all sizes. Um, I'm not a programmer or a developer. I only know a little bit of HTML and CSS. So right off the bat, before we get into this webinar, um, I do want you to know that the information that I'm sharing and talking about you about with you today is for anyone that needs a good website or wants to update their website. And you don't need to know how to write code. You don't have to know any programming language. Um, this webinar's goal is really to give you the information that you need in order to put something functional together for your nonprofit. So don't worry about knowing code or writing HTML or any of that. I barely know it either. And you don't need to know any of that to have a fantastic nonprofit website. Here's a look at what we'll be going over in today's webinar. And just as a tiny bit of housekeeping, um, we will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. So if you think of something you wanna ask while I'm presenting, um, just go back into that questions box of your GoToWebinar panel, and we'll make time to answer that question at the end of the webinar. In case this is your first webinar with Mighty Cause or you're just not familiar with us as a company, um, before we dive in, I just wanted to take a minute to formally introduce our platform to you. Um, Mighty Cause was founded in 2006 as Razoo, um, and we changed our name about a year ago when we became a, an employee-owned company. Um, we're one of the only platforms in this interest industry that is not funded by venture capitalists looking to make, make themselves rich. We're mostly nonprofit workers who wanted to help nonprofits fundraise. Um, we're a full service nonprofit fundraising suite, and we have the most affordable pricing in the industry with our new pricing guarantee, making our platform cheaper to use than PayPal. But instead of just a button, you have a full suite of products at your disposal. Um, our primary customers are small and mid-sized nonprofit organizations, and since we were founded, we've raised over $650 million for causes on our platform. And I wanted to give you a peek at our product suite, which is really designed so that entry-level users and experts can get just as much out of our tools. Um, nonprofits on Mighty Cause all have a beautiful, customizable nonprofit profile where you can tell your story, collect donations, and share photos. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the specific tools that can help you with your website later on in the webinar. Um, we also offer peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, team and event fundraising, some of the best team and event fundraising tools on the market. So so if you have an event coming up or you just want to add some peer-to-peer -peer fundraising to your fundraising arsenal, we're definitely the best platform for that. Um, and our event fundraising technology was upgraded at the beginning of 2019 and it's better than ever. So you get a lot of tools for not very much money and they are entry level and accessible to everybody, but you can also do a lot with them. So we're really a great starting place. And if you've been using a PayPal button or something like that, we're a great way to upgrade your online fundraising efforts. If you're an existing Mighty Cause user um, or you just want to make sure that you have access to all of the tools we have available, you can consider a subscription to Mighty Cause Advanced. It's just $99 per month, which you can pay annually or monthly based on whatever works for your nonprofit. And with a subscription, you'll gain access to some additional tools that can help you take your fundraising 
even higher, um, including our supporters CRM tool, um, which creates records for each donor, fundraiser and volunteers, analytics to dig into your fundraising metrics, and so on. And this is actually exciting. We just launched text to give um, and that is available within advanced subscription. Um, so if you are interested in advanced, just let me know after the webinar. I'm happy to talk with you um, about it or um, do a demo if you'd like, if you're interested in that. All right, so with that out of the way, we'll get into the good stuff. Um, we're going to start off by talking a little bit about why web design is important. So the most important reason your website um, design needs to be thought about is because we live in an age where people will Google you well before they call you or set foot in your building or have any other interaction with you. Um, so your website acts as your front door in many ways for many people. Um, believe it or not, when I worked for a big nonprofit that's been around for more than half a century, we actually had a big filing cabinet in my department that was full of old materials and pamphlets. And that's how people used to get information about our work um, or answers to their questions. They would literally call us on the phone or write to us and ask us a question and they would wait for a packet of information to arrive in the mail, which was spectacularly inefficient. Um, but now people can just Google you and easily find out more about your nonprofit and what you do in the world. Um, it's the first place most people will go when they want to learn more. And since first impressions are important, having a professional and well-designed website is just as important as having a well-lit, nice, accessible, welcoming lobby. Um, it's also really important to have a well-designed website to look legitimate because as a nonprofit, you're asking people for their support. You're asking people to give you money. And if your website is out of date and unprofessional looking, they are not gonna be as likely to trust you and take you seriously with the money that they work hard to earn. And your website is also just a really important resource for people internally. That means your volunteers and your staff um, and your donors as well, who will probably pull up your website and look at information there when somebody calls and emails them with a question. So that's something that staff and volunteers use a lot as well as donors. A strong, well-designed website says several big, important things about your nonprofit. First, it says that you are professional. You took the time to craft a nice, attractive, functional website, and that speaks to how seriously you take your organization and your mission. And even small, volunteer-run organizations can make themselves seem much bigger with a nice website. It also makes you appear legitimate. Um, remember that before people donate, they usually check out your website to try to learn more about you, and they basically vet you online. Um, so when you have a well-designed, robust website with your mission and your information and all of your programs and services listed, your financials, um, you appear transparent, you appear legitimate, and people are much more likely to donate to your organization. So again, your website acts as a welcome mat for people. So a nice website will tell people that you want to welcome new volunteers, new donors, and bring them into your organization and garner their support. So as the flip side to that, let's talk about the damage that can be done to a nonprofit with a bad website. Um, first and foremost, it makes you look untrustworthy. If your website is really rudimentary, poorly designed, and it looks out of date, people might wonder whether or not you're still even operating, and they'll probably be put off from donating. Um, they'll probably leave your website and try another nonprofit, or just think twice about donating if they choose to donate at all. Um, and that means that a website that's bad could cause you to miss out on volunteers, miss out on donors, and miss out on opportunities to help people in your community. Um, a bad website can also just create confusion, um, not only from people wondering if you're still operating, but if you don't update your hours, you may have people trying to visit you when you're closed, or if you don't keep your phone number updated, they may call you and get no response, or if your contact form is broken, you'll miss important messages and so on. It can really just be a nightmare for your organization in terms of relating to the public. It can wreak havoc on your brand, um, and it just stands in the way of you achieving your mission as a nonprofit. A bad website isn't neutral, it can cause very real damage. Um, and a bad website also means that search engines can't find you, um, which might as well means that you may not, you shouldn't even exist. If you can't be found by a search engine, does your website exist at all? Probably not. Um, so you wanna, you wanna make sure that your website um, says 
positive things about you and entices people to learn more. Um, so if you have a job like a, like at a lot of small nonprofits where you're out in the field a lot, you're interacting with people, you're doing direct work with the public, it can seem like your website is sort of this extra thing, um, something that you don't have the time or energy or know how to focus on, but it's really not something that you can write off as secondary or unimportant because it can stand in the way of you doing that important field work. Um, not only from people contacting you and getting the help that they need from your nonprofit if you're a community serving organization, but your ability to continue funding the work itself. So the website, the, the, what that website can do a fair amount of damage. Um, it's not just a neutral thing or you know, something you can brush off. It can really actively harm your organization. All right, so with that fun stuff out of the way, we're going to move into some fundamentals of good web design and some concepts you'll be able to, you'll need to be able to wrap your head around before you can start working on your website. One of the terms you'll hear a lot is UI, um, which means user interface. And user interface is basically all the stuff that people who visit your website use to interact with it. It's basically the structure of the site. Um, and if you've ever watched an old movie that has like websites or computers in it, like War Games, which is what that picture is from, from the 80s, um, user interface is also the things that makes those movies look laughably out of date. The interface is what your site looks like and how it's structured basically. So your UI includes your navigation bar or menu, which is how you'll move around the site. Um, and you'll sometimes see that shortened to nav bar. Any sub menus, so menus that are underneath other menus, um, windows or pop-ups on your site, buttons and links and things that users can click on, a dashboard or a toolbar where users can do things, text entry fields, and again, basically anything a user would utilize to interact with your site is considered UI. So when you're thinking about your site's UI, um, which is basically the starting point for web design, you'll want to keep a few important things in mind. And the first is the look and feel of your site. Your UI really sets the tone for your whole website, and its look should be consistent with your nonprofit's branding. And if you aren't sure what your nonprofit's branding is, building or updating your website is a really great time to think that through and set those branding standards. Um, secondly, your website should be consistent and cohesive. So that means things like choosing one or two different button styles and sticking to those instead of having a new button design every single place you have a button. You'll also want to think about readability, which means considering things like fonts and making sure that you choose the right weight for that font. Thinking about the colors you choose and contrast so that people can easily read your site and find it easy and pleasant to look at. Um, if you're from my generation and have seen sites that were built in the early days of the web on GeoCities and Angel Fire, you can probably recall some websites you saw early on that were just like really hard to read and, and impossible to look, look at. They hurt your eyes um, and that's bad UI. And finally, you'll want to think about uh, structure and how your site is laid out. Um, that means the things on your nav bar, what content you want to highlight, what your CTAs or calls to actions are, and how people can get to that content and so on. Something I highly recommend for anyone who's thinking about a, a website or updating a website is a UI kit. And this can be as simple or as complex as you'd like. Um, basically, a UI kit is a style guide. It's a branding kit. Um, and it involves making decisions about things like what colors you want to use, what button styles you want to use, what icons you want to use. And it can also contain some logos for your nonprofit to suit different situations, such as a light logo, a square logo, a vertical logo logo and or a horizontal logo and so on. Um, when you're creating your UI kit, you'll settle on a handful of colors that are acceptable to use on your site, which fonts to use, um, what their weight should be, and so on. And just to clarify, when I say font weight, it basically means the thickness of a font, um, whether it's light, normal, or heavy, and so on. Um, you can actually download kits that have a series of icons that work together, have a similar style, um, and just add those to your UI kit in bulk. Um, and if you're using a website template, um, which a lot of 
content management systems do. The template often has the UI kit baked in, um, but you may be able to do things like customize your colors and your fonts. But even if you're using a, a site template, this is worth creating and talking about so that your website looks and feels consistent. And even things like documents and pamphlets and stuff that exist outside of your website are branded and consistent and they all reflect one another so that you have a consistent brand. All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about UX or user experience. Um, UX describes the implementation of your UI and the experience that users have when interacting with your website. You want to aim for good UX, obviously, which means that people coming to your website can easily and intuitively find what they're looking for and do whatever it is they came to your website to do. Um, bad UI is when it's confusing and difficult and they can't figure out what to do or where to go on your site. Um, often the result is that people just straight up leave your site when it has bad UI. Um, for me, it helps to think of UX in terms of video games. I'm not a huge gamer, but I'm part of the Nintendo generation, so I do like to play video games from time to time. Um, and a good UI for your website is kind of like Super Mario Brothers. You can easily figure out what to do. It's structured. You know where to go because the screen is literally moving in the direction you're supposed to go in, and Mario is facing that direction. So pretty much anyone can figure that out, and it works really really consistently throughout the game. The easy early stages teach you the game mechanics and train you to understand how to navigate the world in the video game, and it builds on that as it goes. And when it comes to UX for your website, the training happens on your page. You're setting standards when people interact with things, and you're showing them how that works and what to expect when that button is clicked or when they do a certain action on your website. Um, bad UX is confusing, it's unintuitive, and it's jarring, and it makes it difficult for users to accomplish what they want to do and find the information that they're looking for. So it's kind of like if Super Mario Brothers had all of the keys reversed and the question mark blocks that you bump with your head don't do anything, um, except sometimes it does something, but you can't anticipate when it'll do something, and every single level had different mechanics. That's bad UX. That makes people upset and that makes people leave. So when you're thinking about UX, here are the key considerations. Um, the first is accessibility, which means that all of the most important functions on your website are painfully obvious and easy for the user to access. So if something is super important, like donating, for instance, that's not something you'd want to bury in another menu or a submenu. You'd want that easily accessible from your page, clear as day, that they can see here is where I go when I want to donate. Um, functionality is also important, as we discussed, making sure that each of the elements of your website function the way you intend, intend them to, that you don't have broken buttons or links or issues that can cause users to get errors when interacting with your site. You also want to make sure that these elements function in a way that is predictable, because a huge part of something being intuitive is just being predictable. So for instance, if a best practice is to put the login for a site on the upper right-hand side of the screen, and you decide, hey, I'm gonna be different. I'm not gonna put it there. I'm gonna put it on the bottom left side. You just made your site unintuitive because you're putting elements where they are typically not supposed to be, so users have to hunt for them. And users don't like to do that, especially for basic things on the site. Um, another thing might be if you have a button that says learn more, and when the user clicks it, they start downloading a PDF, and there was no warning that clicking that button meant that they would be downloading a file. That's jarring and it's usually really annoying to the user. Um, so that would be a reason to, in your UI, standardize a way to indicate that the user, to the user that they are initiating a file download and then implement that consistently on your site for good UX. And lastly, if you want to step outside of yourself and consider user satisfaction, which means thinking about the things that users will want to do on your site and how easy it is for them to do those things. At the end of the day, UI and UX work together to make your website functional and cohesive and useful to the people who are visiting it. And th these are really the building blocks of having a strong website. Um, as a nonprofit, you'll want to think about the most important functions of your site, like donating or signing up to volunteer, and make sure that UI and UX are working in perfect harmony on those pages, um, which we're gonna get into a little bit more detail about later on. So now with some of the conceptual building blocks out of the way, we're going to get into the nitty gritty of actually implementing some of this 
information and building a website. And the first thing you'll usually do when you're looking to build a website is choose a CMS. So the first question here is probably what is a CMS? Um, a CMS is a content management system and it's basically the tools you'll use to build your website and it's the foundation upon which you will build that website. Um, some popular CMSs are WordPress, Wix, Squarespace, and so on. And in this section, we're um, actually gonna talk about what each of these most popular CMSs does, some pros and cons, so that when you leave this webinar, you can feel prepared to choose the right CMS. Um, or if you already have a CMS chosen, maybe you can say, oh, you know, that's not really the right one for me. I'd like to move to another. Um, and just so you know, we have no professional affiliation with any of these companies. So I'm just evaluating them honestly um, from what I know about them and um, the information that I have on them. When you're choosing your CMS, there are some key questions you'll wanna think about when you're first doing research. First, you'll wanna think about who is building your website. Is it you? Are you paying someone? Are you asking a volunteer? Um, figure out who will actually be the architect and consider their skill level. Have they done this before? Do they have any coding or web design skills or experience? Have they maintained a, a website of this size and nature before? And then think about who will be doing the day to day maintenance, basically the plumber who comes in and keeps the pipes working on your website. Um, it's absolutely fine to hire someone to build a website for you, but if they're a contractor and they have there's an end to that relationship with them, you're probably gonna find yourself responsible for the day-to-day -day maintenance. So you wouldn't want them to build something for you from scratch that you have no idea how to actually maintain. And you'll also wanna think about cost, obviously, that's usually at the top of the list for concerns for nonprofits. Um, and what kind of maintenance would be required, um, anything, any key things you need to do on your site, like for instance, if you work for an animal shelter, you'll probably want an easy way to showcase adoptable animals on your website. And then finally, think about any integrations you require, any programs that you use that are vital to your operations and your website. Um, going back to the animal shelter example, you may need to find a CMS that you can link up to your database of animals in your shelter to be sure that you're providing an up-to-date list of adoptable animals on your site so that people aren't calling about and coming in to meet animals that have already gone home with people. So just think about any integrations, what's most important, what do you use on a day-to-day -day basis, and what would you need um, to have an integration with on the CMS. So here's some things you definitely want to look for in a CMS. Um, first is easy page editing, which usually means a text or a visual editor um, where someone can edit a page without having to go into code. Um, you basically, you also want to add, be able to easily add a page to your website. So if you have a new program or an announcement or something along those lines, you can build a nice landing page for it without too much effort. Um, you want it to be mobile friendly or mobile responsive, and this is non-negotiable at this stage in technology. It needs to be at least mobile friendly, ideally mobile responsive. Um, and again, you'll also want something that offers lots of integrations, especially if you have those specific programs that you will need to integrate into your website. And you'll also want to think about whether or not they offer any customer support. Um, so if your whole website crashes, um, do they have someone who can help you with it? Okay, so now we'll get into the actual CMSs, and the first up is WordPress. Um, WordPress is honestly the standard for nonprofit websites, and that's because there are a lot of pros for WordPress. Um, while some people do have specific training in WordPress, you do not need to be able to write code or be a developer in order to build a really professional, slick WordPress site literally anyone can do it. Um, they have lots of really great themes, um, some of which are free, some of which you pay for, and you can actually get in and customize those, theme, those themes quite a bit, especially if you have the help of someone who knows a little bit of CSS, um, which is basically the visual, visual component of um, web development. WordPress basically runs on plugins, which are tools that you can install on your website that do a specific thing. So there's a plugin for pretty much everything under the sun, and the plugins themselves are either free or not much money, so you have a lot of flexibility to add on to your website at a low cost, um, which brings us to the fact that WordPress is also pretty affordable. Um, 
They have a bunch of different plans and you can even use WordPress for free, though I recommend for a nonprofit getting a professional plan so that you can do more and not have as much of that WordPress branding on your website. Um, WordPress is what I personally have the most experience with. And I have to say this is a great CMS to choose because it's easy to learn and allows you to do a lot with it and editing and adding pages and changing menus is actually really easy through WordPress. Um, on the con, con side, there is a, a bit of a learning curve. Um, you may need some time to get acclimated to WordPress or even take a class or watch some tutorials online. Um, thankfully, there are a lot of those, but you may need to spend some time learning WordPress. Um, a WordPress site, especially if it's self-hosted, meaning that you're using your own domain, really just isn't a plug and play kind of situation. So you may need some training if you've never done it before. Um, you do have to keep your plugins updated and the more plugins you have, the more updating you'll have to do to keep those plugins up to date. Um, because if you don't update them, that might mean that they don't work and it may actually cause security issues with your site. Um, and finally, WordPress does not offer customer support. They have forums where WordPress experts can answer your questions, um, but you can't call them or chat with them. So you'll have to be pretty comfortable troubleshooting on your own or Googling the answers to questions. Next up is Wix. Um, Wix has been doing a lot of great marketing and a lot of nonprofits are starting to use Wix more often. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that. First off, Wix offers drag and drop editing, um, which means that there's not much of a learning curve. Wix is a CMS made for entry level users. It's affordable and it offers multiple plans that will work for pretty much every budget. Um, they have a lot of really attractive templates that you can choose from. And they also offer customer support, which is a big draw. Um, on the downside, it's because it's very simple to use, there's not a lot of opportunity to customize your site. Um, you pretty much have to stay within the confines of the template that you choose. And they don't offer that many integrations. Um, you'll need to use what Wix provides and be okay with that basically. So it's a great CMS for a small nonprofit where you don't have a web expert, but as your nonprofit grows, you may also find that you outgrow Wix and want to do something that allows for a little bit more customization. Um, Squarespace is a lot like Wix, and like Wix, they've been doing a lot of marketing and lots of nonprofits are really moving towards Squarespace as their CMS. Um, it's very much an entry level CMS, and they have a lot of mobile friendly site templates as well as some blogging features. Um, like Wix, they also offer customer support, including live chat, which is a huge bonus. Um, they have most of the same cons as Wix, so if you decide you want a simple entry level CMS, it often comes down to Wix and Squarespace space and honestly the best way to decide between the two is to just look at the templates they offer and see which has the most templates that you like next up is weebly um, which has which got was really popular a few years ago but kind of got pushed aside by wix and squarespace squarespace they were just doing a lot more marketing um, weebly is entry level and it allows you to drag and drop to build pages it's super affordable and they offer phone email and chat support to their customers um, the biggest and most common complaint about weebly is that you are really stuck with what weebly offers so you aren't really able to add much in terms of custom floor and custom elements. They have very limited integrations and your site analytics are not as robust as something like WordPress can provide. Um, but again, it's a really great option if you need something entry level and you don't need a very robust website with lots of integrations. So Joomla is next, and Joomla is not as well known as some of these other CMSs, but it's still being used and it's still popular. Um, Joomla is an open source um, piece of technology, which means that there's no big company behind it. And the big bonus to that is that you don't need to pay any licensing fees, which makes it quite affordable. It's also got an easy editor for content and structure and offers more customization options. So if you're looking for a CMS, you can do a bit more with um, and either have some knowledge or support from people who have experience building a website, this can be a really great option. Um, and if you do decide to work with a developer, this CMS is a good middle ground because developers can get into the back end and customize, but you can also easily edit a page without having to go into the page's code. 
And the big con is that Joomla is more advanced than WordPress, so there's a learning curve there. Um, and while a lot of people specialize in WordPress and know it like the back of their hands, Joomla is a little bit more obscure and fewer people are likely to specialize in using it to build a website. And Joomla also has limited integrations, so that's something to consider if you have a specific integration in mind. And lastly, we'll talk about Drupal. Um, like Joomla, Dr Drupal is open source, so there are no licensing fees involved. It's free to use. Um, Drupal is a more advanced CMS, so it's excellent for building comprehensive websites with lots of information. Uh, what's really cool about Drupal is that they have these flexible taxonomies. So when you're building your website, you can group like pages together, which we'll talk about more in a bit. And it's also scalable, so you can run a very robust website or a leaner one, and Drupal works for both of those. Um, because Drupal is so advanced, it's not entry level, and you may need to work with a developer in order to use Drupal. Um, if you've outgrown WordPress, Drupal is a nice step up. Um, because it's open source, there's no customer support offered, however. And like WordPress, you're kind of stuck using forums for Drupal to get specific help with problems or questions you have. Um, you do need some basic coding skills to work with Drupal. So again, this is more advanced, but a great option if you're looking for something custom, or if you have a volunteer or developer that you're working with to get your website updated or built. So with um, your CMS decision made, we'll move on to what you need to include on your website and what the essential elements of a good nonprofit website are. First and foremost, you need a way for people to donate. This is pretty much the most essential part of any nonprofit website. Um, I recommend putting a way to donate on your navigation bar so no matter where anyone is on your site, they can see a way to donate because your navigation bar is gonna stay with them no matter what page they're on. And you'll also want to create some redundancies so that there are multiple ways people can access donation. Um, so Mighty Cause just released an updated widget, um, and that's a really option, easy option for people to donate. It's an iframe embed, which means it's just a box you plant on a page by adding a small snippet of code, and it actually syncs to your Mighty Cause account. It's mobile responsive, um, so no matter which device someone is using, they can easily make a donation. You can see what the widget looks like here on the page. It can match your branding. It says powered by Mighty Cause. It has the custom options that you can add, um, and you can just plop it right on a page or you just have it on its own page. When it comes to best practices for a donation page, you really want to limit options for people. Um, as nonprofit employees, I'm sure you've all heard of the famous jam study where they offered people a few jams to choose from at the grocery store versus a large number of jams to choose from at the grocery store. And they found that when people are given too many options, they choose nothing, they walk away. And that's because of, of a phenomenon known as decision fatigue. So some nonprofits, and I totally understand why they do this, they wanna provide as many different ways to donate as possible. They wanna cover every single base. But for good web design, you wanna provide the clearest path possible toward your donation page. And that means instead of building a page with the widget on it that also has a PayPal button and a list of items you need for in-kind donations and a link to your Amazon wish list, as well as a request to use Amazon Smile, you should have a page with literally one way to donate. And that page should be super simple, not a lot of distractions so that people are more likely to compete, complete the task at hand, which is donating. So if you have a lot of stuff there, lots of links and so on, um, you're just increasing the likelihood that people will leave the process. So when you're creating a page to accept online donations, keep it really painfully simple. Um, when you have built the page, go back and edit again and just make sure that it is as simple as you can possibly make it. Jumping off of that, you'll want to use clear CTAs or calls to action on your website. So again, if your website was Super Mario Brothers, the clear CTAs are the screen moving and the direction that Mario is facing in so that your users know what to do. Um, so in the example on this slide, you have New Day Series website, and they have multiple clear CTAs on their homepage. And these are actually redundancies because all of the, them are different ways to donate to their organization. Um, but when you go to this page, 
stage, you have we want to have a clear path for what you, you have a clear path for what New Day Syria wants you to do. You can clearly see they want you to donate, they want you to help them build Syria's future, they want you to sponsor an orphan, um, and they want you to get involved and help them. And just to be clear, these CTA buttons need to work, and they should also look the same. So here you can see that they've sort of used a system where their primary CTAs within the button, the buttons are the same. They are using capital capital text to indicate that this is an important CTA. And then their third tier CTA down here has um, you know, just regular capitalization. So that's something that you can sort of work out in your UI kit. Um, but if you go to a lot of websites, you'll kind of see them building that language. And that's what you'll do with your UI kit. Um, sharing information about who your nonprofit is and what you do should be a huge part of your website because, again, people are using your website to vet your nonprofit. So you should have an about menu on your navigation bar. And in that about menu, you should have a sub menu with multiple different options. You should have at a minimum some information about your staff, which you can limit to high level or director level staff, your board of directors, your mission statement, and a little bit of your organization's history. Um, your mission and history can live on the same page if you want. Um, and you should also have some financials available in the form of 990s and annual reports. Um, most people are not going to spend a lot of time digging into your 990s uh, because we barely want to look at them and people who are just members of the public are not going to want to spend forever going through your 990s. But this is part of the transparency we talked about earlier at the beginning of the webinar and having them posted and readily accessible on your website looks good. It makes your nonprofit look trustworthy and when someone is vetting your nonprofit to see whether they want to donate, this is the sort of thing that they typically look for. Um, job postings can go under your about section along with your contact info, how to get in touch with you. And that should also, I should mention, go in the footer of your website so it can be easily accessed. Your footer, like your nav bar, is gonna stay the same um, no matter where you are on your website. So things like your contact information, your location, those should all go in your footer as well as having the page linked in your navigation bar. Um, and then for your location, you'll want to include um, any information like directions um, to your physical location, parking information if you don't have your own lot and it's not totally clear when you get there how you're supposed to park, and of course your hours of operation. Um, those are really important. Let people know when you're open. You should also dedicate some space on the nav bar to talk about how to get involved with your nonprofit. Um, this means posting open volunteer positions, um, information about volunteering, a calendar of events if you have info sessions and orientations, um, what your requirements for volunteers, volunteers are, and what kinds of volunteers you need. Um, lots of nonprofits get questions about group volunteering from schools and businesses, um, and lots of questions about service learning hours. So it's really great to set those things up on your website and make them easy for people to find so that maybe they don't have to call you and ask about them. Or if they send you an email, you can just shoot them a link and easily resolve that question. Um, if you can host your volunteer application on your site, that is even better. Um, and most likely, um, that most likely means that you'll get more people expressing interest in volunteering because that's a lower barrier for entry than having to come in and ask for an application and talk to somebody when everybody's busy, they work a job. If you can put that on your website and allow them to apply through your website, that just makes it easier for them to, to volunteer and get those first few steps out of the way. Um, so definitely small number Profits especially need to lean on volunteers. So um, have that information available on your website front and center and easily accessible so that people can find it and get involved. You should be sure to include a newsletter sign up option somewhere, um, whether that's on your nav bar, a pop up, a box on the side, like on this page um, on, for Capital Area Food Bank or any way you wanna do it, um, but it just needs to be there. Um, you wanna be able to capture leads, nurture them, and hopefully turn these people into supporters. Usually signing up for your newsletter is the first step in building a relationship with your nonprofit. Um, and a lot of people are curious about how do I build my email list? Um, having a tool to do that on your website is really the first step in doing that. Um, I also recommend um, 
off your website setting up a welcome series of emails for people who sign up for your newsletter just to get them oriented to your nonprofit and start that relationship with them. But you definitely want to think about lead capture. We kind of tend to think of that in terms of sales, but for nonprofits, if you have people visiting your website and you're not capturing their information somehow, you're losing potential donors and volunteers. So just make sure that you have some way to sign up for your newsletter on your website. Um, you'll obviously want to detail your programs and services, and we recommend creating a landing page for each program. So if you have a lot of programs like the Animal Humane Society does here on the slide, um, you can separate them by type to make it easier for people to skim through and find what they're looking for. Um, I recommend this as a nav bar item, item because obviously your programs and services are really what it's all about at most nonprofits. Um, and these will probably be some of your most popular and most visited pages, along with just your basic information. You'll want to make sure you have a search tool installed um, so that users can easily search your website and find whatever information they're looking for. Um, this is sort of a redundancy. Um, it's something that, you know, they can find that information in your, your navigation bar and all of your sub menus. Um, but this is really for the person who's like, I don't know what I'm looking at. I just wanna search and find this one piece of information. And you provide a search tool so that they can do that. Um, you can see that Homer Trails Animal Rescue, which is um, screenshotted right here, they put their um, search tool right into their nav bar, which is a really great place for it. Um, and of course, you'll want to test this tool and make sure that it actually works well, because if you don't have a search tool that works well, if it's broken or it just does not pull up relevant or correct results, you have a frustrated user on your hands and they'll probably leave and that's bad UX. So just make sure that this tool works, but it's definitely something that's important to have. Okay, and finally, um, we recommend having a CTA to fundraise um, so people can easily get involved in raising money for your nonprofit since that's um, a way to support you. Um, that's easy to, to, to do. Um, you can see that this, um, that the Capital Area Food Bank included that in their slider on their website. So they have a series of, of CTAs that they're using their slider for. And one of them was to host a digital food drive. Um, but you can also put that on your nav bar, create a dedicated landing page that talks about raising money for your nonprofit um, or a pop-up or a slide-in CTA, however you want to do it. Just make sure that that's an option for people. Um, and just because sometimes people get confused about where to put this, um, if you have an Amazon Smile account that you want to promote on a landing page that talks about the different ways to raise money for your nonprofit would be an appropriate place to put that as opposed to donating to your nonprofit. So now we're gonna move into some web design best practices. And for this section, I got input from Mighty Cause's lead designers who are experts in this stuff. So there's a lot of great information in this section of the presentation. <clears throat> the first best practice and probably the most important is keeping your website and the pages on it extremely painfully simple. And the reason for that is that people's attention spans are really low, especially online. You have seven to 15 seconds to get to the point of a page or a particular thing on your page. And after that, people become distracted and they may leave or do something else or look elsewhere. So this needs to be the cornerstone of every decision you make. How quickly can I get the user to this point to the point of whatever page this page is. For donation pages, for instance, you have seven to 15 seconds. That is it. If you're making a donor wade through 10 seconds of information about donating before they can actually complete their donation, you're probably gonna lose them. So err on the side of simplicity and consider um, and test how long it takes for you to complete tasks or get to certain information on your website, especially if it's key, a key task like donating or signing up for your newsletter um, or a key piece of information. If your contact page is super long, people aren't going to contact you. They're just going to leave. Um, so definitely take a look at your website and the pages within it with this in mind. How easy is, is it for me to complete the task that I'm supposed to complete on this page or find the information that I need? 
So next, make sure you choose the right template because as we discussed, a lot of UI and UX are baked into website templates that you choose. Um, you'll wanna pay close attention to the layout and the navigational styles on a template. Um, lean towards simple design and navigation and look for good logo real estate, um, spots where you'll put your key messaging and having the ability to customize. And be very, very selective with any moving elements on your site, such as sliders or image carousels, um, because while those things are absolutely fine to use, they can really slow down your page load time. Um, and if your page takes forever to load, people are probably gonna leave it. Um, and they can also just be really distracting to users. Um, it's like lots of bells and whistles throwing thrown at them and you wanna keep it simple. So if you have a slider, and a photo carousel and stuff are, stuff is popping up and sliding in at the user, you'll really wanna pare that down to the one thing that's most essential because that is way too much stuff happening all at once. So just be selective with any moving elements. You'll wanna spend some time thinking about font choice and color and how to use those effectively. Um, you should stick to one simple, easy to read font choice for the body of your page. And think about contrast, which is something that a lot of people when they're making their first website don't really think about as much. Um, basically, you wanna think of a newspaper. Um, you don't see newspapers with orange paper and purple text on it because that's impossible to read. So why would you put that on your website? You wanna think about you know what's easy to read what could I read in a book what could I see in a newspaper um, because if something's hard to read like if it was right in front of you it's not going to be any easier to read on a monitor it might actually be harder to read um, so spend some time thinking about the color language on your site um, for CTAs you want to use a bold color which you can define in your UI kit and then use complementary accent colors for things like subheaders and links um, you don't want your website to look like a paint palette just exploded all over it so try to keep your site's colors to five or fewer total and Adobe actually has a really great tool you can use to create a cohesive color palette it kind of you pick one color and it, it chooses complementary colors for you so in the follow-up email to this webinar I'll link you to that um, Adobe color um, tool that you can use to, to pick colors because color theory is one thing that I can't quite get the, the hang of and even designers have a little bit of trouble with um, so that is a really helpful tool to, to keep bookmarked so obviously a best practice is to make sure that your site is mobile friendly because over half of all website traffic is from mobile devices. And that is a percentage that has been steadily climbing for years. Um, when you're choosing a website template, choose one that's mobile friendly and mobile responsive is even better. Um, the difference is that a mobile friendly design is the same regardless of the device. So it's the same design, whether you're looking at it on your phone or you're looking at it on a desktop monitor. And a mobile responsive design um, actually picks up on what device you're using and adapts the design for that screen. So mobile responsive design is preferable, but mobile friendly is the minimum bar you want to meet. Um, most modern websites are actually designed mobile first, and you should keep that in mind when you're designing. For instance, when you're putting a gallery of images on a page side by side, keep in mind that on a mobile device, those images will stack one on top of the one on top of each other because that is how mobile pages look. They have to stack things instead of putting them side by side. Um, you should test out your website on different devices to make sure that it looks good and make sure that you can easily access everything you need from a mobile device. Also, not many people use Adobe Flash anymore um, on websites. It's just kind of something that's out of date. But in case you're tempted to use Adobe Flash on your website, um, don't <laughs> because they don't work on mobile devices unless you install an app um, on the device, which most people don't want to do. So don't use Flash. As we discussed earlier, it's important to be consistent. So when you create your UI kit, actually use it and stick to it. Um, be disciplined about sticking to that UI kit. And if something sticks out or does not follow the standards that you set in your UI kit, change it and make sure that it is consistent. Um, stay consistent with the fonts, the color choices and button styles on your site. And this is really important. Make sure that the elements of your site function consistently um, so that you don't provide like a frustrating jarring experience for the user where they can't predict how certain elements are going to behave. 
So this is really more about structure. And we did talk about this recently in the SEO webinar we did last month, which I recommend um, taking a, a look at if you are interested in updating your website and in web design. Um, but I wanted to revisit this topic because it's, um, it's about website structure, which is really important. In general, you'll want to create pillar pages, which is a general landing page for a category of things. And then pages branch off from that pillar page. So for instance, if you're an animal rescue, you may want to have a pillar page about cats. A, a general pa the page, about cats would be your pillar page. And from that page, you'll have topic clusters, which is where you'll drill down and get more granular and specific. So all of your information about adoptable cats goes together um, and specific subjects get their own page. All of your information about cat behavior stays on the pillar page and then links off to more specific items. Um, cat health goes on the pillar page so that if somebody wants to know more about cats, they can find it there. And then you'll provide links to all of the specific information that you have about cat health. Um, you wanna think of pillar pages and topic clusters as a Russian nesting doll, um, where in this big doll, which is your pillar page, you have lots of smaller, smaller dolls, which are your topic clusters, or maybe thinking of it as a tree with branches and leaves on those branches makes more sense to you. Um, but this is important to think about not only for easy navigation and search visibility, but so that you can build up the content on your website without making it a giant mess of incomprehensible pages that are not connected to each other. Um, I know that if I'm looking for information about getting my newly adopted cat used to my house, I can go to your cat's page and I can find what I'm looking for there. So this is a, a way to structure your, your site um, in a way that makes sense as an intuitive for the user and also as the designer and the, the owner of the page Page allows you to build on topics without having to start from scratch. Okay, so the last thing is that you'll want to comply with HTTPS protocol, and you'll want to make sure that your site is secure. Um, you want your website to be HTTPS in the URL and not just HTTP, and you'll want that little lock to appear on your browser when people visit your site. Um, you'll see it in the, the URL bar where you have the, the site address. Um, you really want to look for that little lock. Um, this means um, evaluating security when you choose a CMS, um, purchasing and activating your SSL certificate, and updating your WordPress plugins if you're using WordPress, WordPress, and being cautious about giving access to your website, and of course using secure passwords. Um, WordPress in particular has some specific recommendations about security, like installing a backup plugin and a security plugin, so you'll just want to make sure that that's done. Most browsers will alert a user when a site is not secure. So when you're asking them to enter their credit card information and share their email addresses, that's not going to happen if their browser is telling them that the site is not secure and it's not safe for them to enter that information. Um, so this is actually probably the top mistake that I see nonprofits make, and it's such an easy one to correct. So if your site is not secure, please take steps to secure it. If you do nothing else that we talk about on this webinar, make sure that your site is secure. Um, so again, I just want to plug our widget um, since we just updated it last week. It's free to all Mighty Cause users and allows you to collect donations on your site very easily. And the big update to the widget is that you can now accept recurring donations through the widget. Um, you can also collect donor info, including their addresses if you have that enabled on Mighty Cause, set custom donation amounts, and add descriptions to your donation suggestions. It'll pull in the theme color from your Mighty Cause page um, so you can make sure it matches the color in your UI kit. And on this slide, you can see the whole process from start to finish. It's three easy steps to make a donation. So when we're talking about making something really simple, this is just three steps from start to finish for donors, and it's very easy for them to use. And lastly, I wanted to talk a minute about Mighty Cause versus PayPal, um, because we see a lot of Mighty Cause users using a PayPal button on their website, and we're confused about why, um, because PayPal buttons do just one thing. They process donations for you. And the, in the process of taking of accepting donations, they actually take you off your website and into PayPal. Um, Mighty Cause provides a full fundraising suite with donor engagement tools, comprehensive reporting, peer-to-peer -to -peer fundraising, 
team and events, all that stuff. And it can be embedded on a page without taking the user off your website. Uh, it doesn't take them anywhere else on the internet. They complete the full transaction within the iframe. So when you're thinking about your website, um, just give the widget a try. If you're using a PayPal button, that's a really easy change to make um, to make donation easier on your website. Um, and it provides a better donor experience, but it also makes things easier for your nonprofit um, because we sync it with your Mighty Cause account. And it's really not any more complicated to install than a PayPal donate button. And just as an inside bit of info, this is the first time um, we're announcing this, but very soon we're actually going to be releasing embeddable donation forms, um, which are more comprehensive than our widget. So stay tuned for that announcement soon if you're signed up for our newsletters. All right, so we're um, just at almost at an hour. We've got about uh, 10 minutes for questions. So if you have a question for me, just type that into the questions box of your GoToWebinar panel, and uh, we'll get to some of these questions. Let's see. Okay, um, this is a question about the location of a donation box from the bottom of the page to the top of the page. I'm not totally sure of, um, if that's a general question or specifically about the widget. So you can, if you can clarify in the questions box, um, I am happy to answer that question for you. Otherwise, we can sort of connect offline about um, how to do that for you. Um, yes, we'll be sending the video and slides of the webinar. So um, stay tuned for those. Those will probably go out um, tomorrow afternoon once I'm able to actually get the, the recording up on YouTube um, and get the slides uploaded. You'll, you'll be sure to get those so you can share it with anyone you'd like. Two questions. Um, okay, so if we do not have 990, since we are current, we currently don't make 50k. Should we show our e-card filing? Um, if you don't have 990s, I would talk to your accountant and see what is appropriate to put on your website. Um, I'm not totally sure, to be honest with you. If you have 990s, you should put them up there. If not, that may work. Just check with your accountant to make sure that what you're putting up there is appropriate. And the other solution is if you don't want to put any actual documents up there, an annual report can sort of serve that function until you're at the point where you're filing 990s. So um, that is a way to report on how you're using the money that your nonprofit gets um, and you're reporting on your impact as well. So you can do that instead of 990s, um, but some sort of financial transparency is really helpful to have on a nonprofit website because people look for that when they're deciding whether to make a donation to your nonprofit or not. Um, so it's important to have something there. 990s are ideal if you're a larger nonprofit and you have those. If not, just talk to your accountant and see what is helpful to put up there that doesn't you know, put you in a weird position as a nonprofit, but an annual report will also work just as well. Okay, so this is an interesting question. Our parent company has a similar name, but it is for our nonprofit. We currently have a page or two on the parent site. Should we look at creating a separate site later? Yeah, I would definitely, um, you know, recommend having your own website and specifically having your own domain. So even if you're not at the point yet where you want to create your own website, um, I would look into purchasing the domain because especially if it's a common name, um, sometimes, don't, some, sometimes domain names can be uh, bought up from underneath you. Um, we actually have a, a similar situation. There's two animal shelters in um, the Northern Virginia region where Mighty Cause is located. One is the Animal Welfare League of Arlington and one of the, is the Animal Welfare League of Alexandria and they both use the acronym AWLA. So only one of them could have AWLA.org as their domain name, their website address. So um, definitely take a look and make sure that your name is still available. If it is available, purchase that domain name um, and you can build the site later. Just the domain name is the thing that can be trickiest because if you have one that you really want and it gets bought from underneath you, it's, it's not easy to get that from somebody else. So purchase your domain name at the very least and you can build a website at a later time when you're ready to do so and it's appropriate for you to do so. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so there's a question about securing your website and if you can do that yourself. Yeah, so the first step is um, getting an SSL certificate. Um, you may need some help if you're really just not sure where to go with this, but I would Google SSL certificate 
and just see what's involved with it because there are step-by-step -step instructions on um, the internet that you can easily find that'll walk you through the process. A lot of um, CMSs will actually sort of include that um, when you build a website through them. So that's another thing you can take a look at if you're looking at a new CMS or if you're currently using a CMS, they may have a way for you to um, secure your website through your CMS. Um, so just uh, make sure that there's no easy way for you to do that. You will need to purchase an SSL certificate um, in order to uh, make your site secure. But there's a couple of ways to do that. Just Google it. There's some step-by-step -step instructions and check if your CMS has a way for you to easily do that through them. Uh, okay, so without a developer, I would say Google and then just check with your CMS and see if there's some way you can do it with that within the CMS um, so that but you can easily do it. It's not super complicated. It sounds intimidating, but it's 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 not, I swear. Um, there's another question about security. Are there any websites other than WordPress that offer a plugin to secure the site? Um, so WordPress has sort of, I don't know if it's trademark, but they are the only CMS that uses plugins um, in that particular way. Um, most CMSs have a system for you to secure your site when you're setting it up. So it's not specifically a plugin, but most of them, if you, especially if you purchase a domain name, through your CMS, which you can do through most of the CMS, I think all of the CMSs we talked about in the webinar, um, they have a way for you to secure the site. They have a process in place. So um, check with your CMS if you're already using one. Um, with WordPress, they are the only ones that use plugins. It's kind of their thing is, is plugins. Um, but yeah, definitely. Um, confused about what a pillar page is. So, that's that's a good question. It's, it's a little bit more of an advanced concept. Um, and just to, as a note, it's 259. I will stay on the webinar and answer questions as long as you guys have them. Um, but if you need to log off, you can certainly do that. But I'm, I'm, I'll stay on a little bit late to answer some questions. Um, so a pillar page is you'll see them. So go to a couple of websites, go to Mighty Causes website. You'll see that you have these pages in the navigation bar that are about a specific subject um, and they branch off to other pages. So there's links within that page. Um, it's kind of a pillar page is the tree trunk. So if you have one particular subject, let's say you're a food bank and you have a pillar page that you want to build where you talk about food insecurity because you have all these other related pages about the specifics of food insecurity. Um, you would create a food insecurity pillar page and then you connect all of the related pages and information to that pillar page. It's a tree trunk with lots of branches coming off of it, basically. That's the easiest way to think of it. Um, but next time you're sort of poking around the web um, and you click on some some pages on a navigation bar, um, just take a look because you'll, you'll start to see them out in the wild and they are easier to, to spot than they are to describe. Um, but you can also just Google pillar pages and there's lots of, there's lots of examples of those. Um, but it's basically just a, a landing page that other pages branch out into, so or branch off of. So, like I said, if you were an animal shelter and you wanted to do a page on cats, just generally talking about cats on the pillar page, and then here are the different topics that we address related to cats, and here are some pages with more specific information about cats. So that you know, if I go to your website and I'm like, I don't know, I want to just get more information about cats, or I have a cat. What can I learn about my cat here on your website? I can go there and have that broken down into several different sections and then specific information about it's basically I'll send some more information in the email because it is a lot easier to, to see than to describe. Um, but you'll see them out in the wild. And it's basically just a way of organizing information so that all of your related pages and all of your related information is in one place. And that's all a pillar page is. It's just one place where you collect all of your information on one topic and then allow people to search for more, get more information if they want to. All right, we've got lots of questions. Um, yeah, I will be sending the PowerPoint presentation out. Um, oh, can you briefly explain cookies, pop-ups, slider, sliders, and plugins? Um, so those are all different things. Um, but basically a cookie, um, <laughs> 
So cookies are basically, it saves a little piece of information from your visit to a website. So for instance, if you are shopping for shoes online and you go to a website and you look at one particular pair of shoes, your browser will store a cookie saying, oh, she went to this website. And so that's why you'll see when you go to Facebook, when you go to different places on the internet, you'll see those shoes pop up again because your browser has saved that piece of information at, that you have looked at that pair of shoes and they'll plug it in for you in different places. If you also um, are saving information on a website, that requires a cookie. So that's basically all that really is. Um, as a person who's building a website for a nonprofit, you don't really have to worry as much about cookies aside from maybe disclosing that your website, um, you know, gives that you have used cookies on your website. So that's not really a huge concern for nonprofit administrators. Um, pop-ups, um, pop-ups are basically, it's just a little window that pops up that asks you to do something. Um, usually that thing is signing up for a newsletter um, or it could be a pop-up saying, um, hey, we have an event coming up. Um, would you like to attend the event or click here to learn more about the event? So a pop-up is really just a marketing tool. Um, if you wanna get somebody's attention really quickly, um, there's a couple of programs and plugins that you can use um, to set up pop-ups that you know basically give people specific information. It's basically waving your hands and going, hey, listen to this thing, or please do this thing. Um, you don't wanna have too many of them. Um, you wanna be selective with them, and you can actually set it so that they only display on certain pages, or if somebody has scrolled down on a specific page, a certain amount, a certain percentage. Um, but that's all a pop-up is. It's, a diff it's basically a way to capture a lead. Um, so a lead is a person who comes to your website, they're interested in what you have to offer, and this is a way that you can get their information. Um, you can use pop-ups to, I, I think probably the best way to use them is to have newsletter signups through a pop-up. Um, Optin Monster is a really great entry-level program that's compatible with WordPress and a lot of different um, email software. So Optin Monster is something you can check out if you're interested in having um, a pop-up on your website. And there are a lot of CMSs that will have built-in ways for you to create pop-ups for people. You just want to be selective and not bombard people with them and make sure that, you know, if you have a piece of information you want to share with somebody, that you're sharing it in the right place. Um, sliders, um, there's, I'm not sure here if we're talking about sliders on a website, but basically a slider would be like a rotating, um, you'll see them on a lot of websites. They're usually near the top and they have usually an image, a little bit of text and a call to action button and they'll rotate. So as you stay on the page, the, the slider will change to a new image, new bit of text and a new CTA button. So usually there's about four of them in a slider. Um, they're, they're used fairly frequently for nonprofits who usually have a lot of information they wanna communicate to people, um, but that's what a slider is. They also have, there's also sliding in pop-up boxes. So I don't wanna confuse you too much, but you can also make pop-up boxes. Instead of popping up in the middle of the screen, they'll slide in on the side. So that's something else a slider can be. And a plugin, as we discussed, is sort of a tool that you can use on WordPress. Um, you can, it's basically like plugging in an additional tool. Like if I want to make it easy for people to share um, my page to their Facebook page, I can plug in that particular plugin on WordPress and it has a tool that's designed by people outside of WordPress. That's the important thing to remember about plugins is that usually these are just developers who are designing these um, plugins either to, to make money or because they, they identified a need within WordPress for this particular plugin. Um, and so they developed the plugin, you can search for them through your WordPress dashboard um, and install them on your site. And it's just a tool that allows you to do a specific thing. And that's kind of the building blocks of a WordPress site is having these different plugins for different functions and elements of the site. Um, it, makes more sense when you actually like look at the back end of a, a WordPress site and see what that looks like. Um, but a plugin is just a tool that you plug in that you use to do a specific thing. Um, and they are usually um, designed by people who are not affiliated with WordPress. They're independent. So you want to look at reviews um, so that you don't download and install a plugin that's garbage and doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Okay, this is a long question. A fundraiser finished his goal and is now looking for approval to take over the org. 
Um, this is, I think this is probably a question for support. So um, Mary, if you wanna just uh, reach out to support at mightycause.com, they can certainly um, get you the answer to the question and walk you through solving that issue. Um, it was a question about advanced. Does Mighty Cause offer one-on-one -on -one tutoring other than the 99 per month uh, subscription? So tutoring, we don't really actually offer any one-to-one -one, um, like tutoring or coaching. Um, we are always willing to set up a call with you and talk through um, an issue with you. If you have, you know, an idea or you are, you just have general questions, we have fundraising experts on staff that can set up a call with you and talk through it. So we are available to you um, if you have a specific need and you'd like to talk to the Mighty Cost staff about it. Um, we also offer eBooks that are free to download. We offer a monthly webinar like this one that's totally free to sign up for. Um, so as far as like coaching, that's kind of the extent of what we offer. We actually offer quite a bit more than a lot of other platforms that kind of just offer basic technical support. We can help you with, str with strategy um, and fundraising efforts and it help you get set up with an event or whatever you're looking to do. If you want to brainstorm a campaign with us, we are available. Just email support at mightycause.com with whatever you're looking to do. And we'll, our staff is here to talk to you um, about whatever you'd like to do. And you don't need a subscription to do that. You can just be one of our free users. Um, but yeah, email support if you have any questions. Um, our support staff is really friendly and they're able to help you with anything you got. Um, okay, so we should we show different tools to donate on the landing page or just one? This is a great question. So um, don't, I would stick with one tool because it's the, it's the jam study again. If you're offering me five different jams, I'm gonna get overwhelmed and it's gonna take me a bunch of time to decide which tool I wanna use and I'm probably just gonna walk away. And there are studies that show that that is how users behave. When you put too many things on the page and too many options, people choose nothing. They don't do anything, they take no action because they experience decision fatigue. So my recommendation is to put one donation tool on your donate page um, and stick with that tool so if you like paypal and you want to continue using paypal keep using your paypal donate button if you want to use the widget and that works for you stick with the widget but a bad thing is to take the widget and put that on a page and then put the PayPal button underneath that page. And then underneath that say, well, you can also mail us a check at this address or you can Venmo us money at this address and so on and so forth because people just get confused. They wanna be told what to do. Um, that's probably one of the few areas of life where people want to be told what to do is online when they're trying to complete a task. They want you to tell them where to go and what to do. Um, so I would recommend just sticking with one donation tool. Um, and if you need to have different options for people, um, I would create a separate landing page for those. I wouldn't say, um, you know, create a landing page for the Mighty Cause widget and create a landing page for the PayPal button. When you're talking about a donation tool, you're talking about online donations only. So you should have one online donation tool, whatever you choose for your tool and just stick with that tool. But if you wanted to talk about in-kind donations, create a separate page for that where you can list out, you know, what um, what you would like donated, where to bring it, what hours to bring it, and so on. If you want to create a page where you talk about Amazon Smile, you can do that, create a separate page for that, because those are separate needs. Somebody who wants to make a monetary donation online doesn't want to wade through a bunch of information about in-kind donations because that's not what they're looking to do. So just think through that user experience. When you have multiple different options, um, people just get confused. So just stick with one donation tool. All right. Um, can you explain the difference between integration with another website and the link to another website that you post on your website? Okay, so this is a good question. And integration means that there's actually you're you, you're pulling in a little bit of that tool for your website. So, for instance, a link to your website. If you can link out to, you know, a prof your Mighty Cause profile, for instance, you're not integrating with Mighty Cause in any way. Um, that's just a, a link. Um, an integration would mean 
Um, it would be more along the lines of the widget where there's a little piece that you install on your website that does not require going to some another page or another website to complete a task. Um, some things that you'll want to look at are like integrations with certain email services. So basically an integration means that two different websites or two different programs are talking to each other. There's a bridge between them. And sometimes it means actually putting a piece of that website or program on your page. A link is just a link out. It has what it can do one thing, you can go there and, and then the other page takes that over. An integration is actually two pages or programs talking to each other. Um, and sometimes you'll see an API, um, you, you insert a piece of that page onto your website and that is what an integration is. So if you're fine with a link and you don't need an integration, then th then that's fine. You don't need to look for an integration with that. But like for instance, the example I gave with an animal shelter, if you had a database of adoptable animals and you wanted to integrate that onto your website, that means that when one of your staff member goes into your database and processes, processes an adoption, for one of those animals, that that animal is taken down off your website so that they're no longer displaying as being adopted as being adoptable. So I hope that makes sense. It's instead of just sort of linking out to something, you're actually pulling it into your website and talking to another program. Okay, what do you think about a subdomain for donation only? I think that works. Um, yeah, you can do whatever works for you. We do subdomains on Mighty Cause. So that's something you'll see on Mighty Cause is um, subdomains. Um, so that's something that can happen. Uh, I don't think there's any problem with that. Sometimes users can get confused about that when I've worked for nonprofits. Um, you know, they'll be like, hey, why does that why does it say mighty cause in the url just because they're concerned about security and they don't necessarily understand how subdomains work so that is kind of um of the balancing act you can always try it some users say nothing because they've seen them before and they know that it's secure other users might call you and say hey what is this because they just want to make sure that their their donation is secure so um you might just want to think about your donor base you can always try it out see what kind of feedback you get um you can do something called a domain mask for um a domain which basically it's you're using like for instance, if you had dot mighty cause, if you had, you know, your nonprofit dot mighty cause dot com as your as a subdomain on our website and you wanted to hide that and make it look like it was it says like it was something else, like it wasn't mighty cause, you could do that. It's a little bit more complex, um, but it can be worth it if you have donors who are sensitive to that. Um, but yeah, subdomains are fine. Um, you can definitely um, explore that. Um, I think it's always helpful if you can put it on your own domain. Just for, like I said, for security for users. There's no security issue with it, but it just makes donors feel more secure because if they see a jump to a, a, a different name in the URL, they can go, oh my goodness, what is this? And think that somebody's trying to steal their credit card information, which is unfortunately just an experience that a lot of users have. It's totally normal, So, um, but it's totally fine to use. All right, so I think that is all of the questions. Um, if you guys have anything else that you are curious about, um, you can certainly email me. My email address is lynda at mightycause.com. Um, we've covered a lot of ground today. So if you think of something um, after the webinar, just let me know. I will make sure that all of you get the slides and the recording of the webinar so that you can share it with your team if you'd like or just review it at a later time. Um, thank you so much for sticking with me for uh, an hour and 15 minutes. I really appreciate it. And I hope that you guys have an excellent day. Thank you.